what determines the real exchange rate? To answer that, we need the market for foreign exchange. To set that up, we need the balance of payments. The balance of payments is an accounting of all the payments that cross a country's borders, classified by category and direction. Well, what are the main payments that cross a country's borders and the purposes for which those payments are made? Locals are importing, they are paying for goods that are produced in another country. Foreigners are importing, paying for services that are produced in the local economy. Foreigners may also be taking ownership of productive assets, fixed capital in the local economy. Or locals might want to invest some of their wealth in financial assets in other countries, in stocks and bonds. So these are the kinds of transactions, transactions that require international payments that the balance of payments tries to capture. The categories are the trade in goods, in merchandise. If the product goes from this country to another country, it's an export and there is an inflow of foreign exchange from that. If the product goes from outside the economy and is brought in to be consumed in the local economy, then that's an import and it therefore represents a foreign exchange outflow. There's also a trade in services and you have imports and exports of services. Those are classified as part of the current account. The current account also includes payments for factors, factor services, like labor, like migrant labor. And also includes remittances, which, which falls in the same category. In addition to the buying and selling of goods, services, and factors, the trade in goods, services, and factors, we also have the purchase and sale of assets, fixed assets, fixed productive assets, called foreign direct investment, and you can have inward foreign direct investment, so foreign exchange will flow in, and you have outward foreign direct investment. The, the foreign exchange flows out. The other kind of asset, which can be bought and sold, is portfolio assets, stocks and bonds. So you have portfolio inflows and portfolio outflows. In addition to those two main categories that make up the capital account, there are other flows as well. For example, you have the authorities' ownership of foreign assets, of foreign exchange, of, of foreign, foreign exchange denominated assets called the net international reserves. So this represents the main parts of the balance of payments. It is literally an accounting of the flows in and out of a country of foreign exchange. For the sake of understanding the foreign exchange market, we're going to simplify a bit and ignore the relatively minor categories of foreign exchange flows and focus on the trade balance and the net of capital inflows and outflows for both productive assets and financial assets. We're going to focus on the trade balance and net capital inflows. And we're going to graph those to represent the foreign exchange market. On the horizontal axis, 
we are measuring foreign exchange, foreign exchange transactions. But this is not all the transactions, all the foreign exchange transactions involving US dollars in the entire world. We are talking about demand for and supply of US dollars in exchange for local currency. So this is a narrow slice of the, the global foreign exchange market. It's the market for exchanging local currency for US dollars. On the horizontal axis, we have the real exchange rate, the relative price of foreign goods to local goods. The two curves that are going to capture inflows and outflows of foreign exchange are those from the capital account and those from the current account. Net capital inflows we represent as a vertical line suggesting that foreign direct investment and portfolio flows are invariant with respect to the level of the real exchange rate. A foreigner who is investing in the local economy is investing because he expects a certain rate of return. That rate of return is going to be intrinsic to whatever is the asset he or she is investing in. If the exchange rate doesn't change during the period between when the investment is made and when it is liquidated and repatriated along with its earnings, then the level of the exchange rate doesn't matter. So, as a simplification, we represent net capital inflows, the net inflows of foreign exchange from the capital account as a vertical line. It doesn't mean that capital inflows, net capital inflows won't change. For example, they'd be affected by interest rates in the local economy because interest rates determine the earnings from the investment. If there was an, an increase in net capital inflows for whatever reason, then we show that as a shift of the NKI curve to the right. Consistent with what we are saying that might have come about because of an increase in local interest rates at a time when international interest rates have not increased by the same amount. So that's one part of the foreign exchange market, the part that comes from capital flows. We now need to capture the foreign exchange flows that are due to international trade. The net demand for foreign exchange for the purposes of international trade is the excess of imports over exports, the trade deficit. And to see what the trade deficit curve is going to look like, we start with the current trade deficit and the current real exchange rate. And we suppose that there's an increase in the real exchange rate. And ask the question, how does that affect the trade deficit? How does that affect the net demand for foreign exchange for trade purposes? Well, an increase in the real exchange rate is going to make imports relatively more expensive. And so the volume of imports is going to decline. And it makes domestic production a relative bargain to the rest of the world. And so exports are going to increase. The trade deficit shrinks. And with a smaller trade deficit, then the net demand for foreign exchange for purposes of trade is going to be less. Therefore, the M minus X curve, the curve that represents the demand for foreign exchange, the net demand for foreign exchange for trade purposes is downward sloping. So these two curves reflect 
all of the inflows and outflows, that is, all of the demand and supply for foreign exchange in our simplified representation of the foreign exchange market. How does this work? Well, if the real exchange rate is such that there is more demand for foreign exchange to pay for the trade deficit than is coming in from net capital inflows, then the banks and cambios are going to notice that their float of foreign exchange is, is falling. And soon they won't have any foreign exchange to sell to people who are coming in. And so they are going to increase the exchange rate because they want to discourage so many people from buying it. The exchange rate is going to rise. If the exchange rate is such that they have the opposite problem, that more foreign exchange is coming in than is going out, then they're going to see their foreign exchange float rising. And banks and cambios are not in the business of accumulating foreign exchange. They're in the business of trading foreign exchange. They make money on the turnover. For an exchange that is accumulating and is not being sold means they don't make money on the spread. So they are going to lower the exchange rate that they are posting because they want to encourage more people to come in and buy the foreign exchange that is accumulating. So the exchange rate is going to fall. And in this way, the foreign exchange market is going to tend towards the value of the real exchange rate that equates inflows and outflows of foreign exchange, where the outflows to finance the trade deficit is equal to the inflows from the capital account. Representing the foreign exchange market in this way allows us to explain why a country can't ever save foreign exchange. In, in, in popular discourse, discussion about trade policy, from time to time you hear that somebody will promote an economic policy because it will save the country foreign exchange. For example, people will sometimes try to promote an import substitution policy because it saves the country foreign exchange. But a market-determined exchange rate, as we are representing here, is not one where a country can save foreign exchange. Let us suppose that a particular local manufacturer does persuade the Minister of Trade that he should erect an import barrier to a competing import to the manufacturer's product so that the country can save foreign exchange. So the import barrier, either a quantitative ban or a high tariff is instituted. So people no longer buy that imported product. The M minus X curve shifts to the left because there is initially less demand for foreign exchange to buy the imported product. But now, we have an excess supply of foreign exchange. And that gap is going to cause the real exchange rate to fall. And when the real exchange rate falls, what is happening is that the market is incentivizing people to come in and buy the foreign exchange that would have been saved. The market doesn't want to save foreign exchange the market wants to clear. So the exchange rate falls to induce you to buy now cheaper imports of other goods and services. And this continues. The exchange rate will keep falling until all of the foreign exchange, all of the net foreign exchange that is coming in is used up. The market wants to clear. The exchange rate is going to shift in order to make inflows and outflows equal. 
So we end up with the foreign exchange market clearing with the trade deficit once again being equal to net capital inflows. And in terms of the amount of foreign exchange available, we're back to where we started. In a market determined exchange rate, a country cannot save foreign exchange. Suppose the government manages its expenditure better. Suppose the government decides to increase, improve its fiscal stance. So it reduces government expenditure, which is either going to narrow the fiscal deficit, or if there's a surplus to begin with, to expand the fiscal surplus. How does that affect the foreign exchange market and international trade? This exercise allows us to tie together two different parts of the macroeconomy to remind us that an economy is a system where the different parts are connected. The rate of interest is determined in the credit market, in the market for investable or loanable funds. The government, if it's running a fiscal deficit, is usurping some of the available savings in the local capital market in order to finance that fiscal deficit, in order to pay for the extra spending. If the government is running a fiscal surplus, if it has more revenue than it is spending, then it is placing those surplus funds in the local capital market, making more funds available for borrowers. So if the fiscal, if the, if the government reduces its expenditure and the fiscal deficit falls, then more savings is available for investors. The interest rate falls in the economy and more investment takes place. But that lower rate of interest is going to affect the foreign exchange market because the local rate of interest affects net capital inflows. A lower rate of interest means that net capital inflows is going to fall because the local economy is a less attractive place for portfolio investment. So with lower net capital inflows, then there is an initial shortage of foreign exchange and the exchange rate begins to rise precisely to ration that foreign exchange amongst importers to make it more expensive to import. So the rise in the exchange rate reduces the trade deficit. So we're able to see that there's a relationship between the fiscal deficit, the government's plans for expenditure and revenue, and the trade deficit, the gap between imports and exports. But our purpose in this lesson was to determine the real exchange rate. And we have seen that the real exchange rate adjusts to equate foreign exchange inflows and outflows.